thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, Professor Taylor Pavi, I was wondering if you could make perhaps some observations or comments on the phenomenon of postmodernism and its impact on the imperative for political struggle. Um, my sense is that uh, in the West we've become increasingly uh, spiritual consumers, brought in in that sense, faith has sort of taken on the life of a consumer product. Uh, uh, as we sort of jump from one sort of expression of our spiritual taste to another. Um, but uh, the disconnection between uh, truth and faith and justice, if you don't have the notion of truth, to what extent does that undercut the notion of justice and the validity of political struggle? Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, there's about 10 questions <laughs> can, I, can I drop postmodernism? Because I never figured out what it meant. I mean, it, it, uh, and I don't think anybody figured it meant. But yeah, I mean, there is a certain kind of consumer relationship to, uh, to religion, because any new form, any new ethic can be lived in a really very noble and very self-demanding demanding of self form are also in very trivial and light forms. I mean, there are immense examples of the trivialized form of Christianity <laughs> throughout our history and any other religion, but there are also much more stringent ones. I don't see the sign that people are less serious about their spiritual lives than in any past age. You know? it's, it certainly exists. But it would be, I think people often make a mistake that uh, <clears throat> you can have societies in history in which the majority of the people declaring themselves Christian were extremely conventional and lived lives which were really controlled by the culture, etc. And people say, well, that's Christianity, you know, you need something different. And it, uh, that's, that's kind of mistaken judgment. It's not uh, the fact that a given faith or a given outlook can be lived in a very trivial fashion doesn't mean that. It's not worth examining. But I, I mean, I, I see other questions there too. Truth, yeah. Well, um, what is our relation to truth in, um, in a faith like Christianity? I think people say we have the truth. I don't feel I have the truth. I feel I'm seeking and I'm seeking in this particular direction, I mean, it, it, yeah. and there is some truth there that uh, I may never fully capture, but it is there. But I don't feel that I have it. And when people do say that, I, <laughs> I wonder exactly what they, what they mean, right? But so there is um, thinking that we, we have to possess the truth in order to, for instance, have justice and so on. I think it's just, is a, it's the wrong verb to use here, and it's a dangerous verb. And it, I mean, among other things, I think it stops you from moving closer. Hi, so just an open question on the, to all three panellists on the novel nature of pluralism in the West. I just wonder how the modern situation or the situation that was described as being the norm in the East differs significantly from, say, the situation of the Cathars before the repression, the development of new religious movements such as the Scotsi, um, the widespread Gnostic and Nestorian views before the establishment of the Catholic Church, and then in the East, the regular wars between, for example, the Buddhists and the Taoists in China to dominate the religious life of the, empire, of the Chinese Empire, the fights between different sects of Buddhists for the same thing in Japan, the wars between the Buddhists and the Shinto. I, just, I wonder, is, is, is is pluralism new? Well, I mean, 
depends on what we mean by pluralism. I mean, it, it, pluralism, the existence of a plurality of views and so on. No, I mean, it's been going on for a very, very long time. So the interesting issue is what are the, what's the sense of the proper mode of relationship, the proper mode of engagement, right? So when we say pluralism, we usually mean a conception of the mode of engagement in which there's a very large degree of mutual respect, mutual acceptance, uh, uh, even sometimes uh, seeing something positive in the fact that we're existing along with others. Right? That's, and that, unfortunately, isn't always evident. I mean, there are two ways in which it can fail to be the case. One is when people actually fighting. But another is a world in which they're very enclosed. I mean, th there have been times when there are communities existing side by side, but very enclosed, very uninterested in the other, even thinking the others are somehow, you know, strange, different, and so on. But not, that doesn't become the basis of actual fighting. That becomes the basis of self enclosed communities. And an awful lot of religious. So let's say, let's talk about plurality that there are many, as against pluralism. Pluralism is one of the ways, of, I mean, the way that I think we all favor for existing together in a condition of plurality, which has been endemic. You, Can I? You, you, go ahead. No, I think uh, well, I, I also would like to introduce two different kinds of pluralism. I mean, one in one, you have uh, different groups uh, with very clear identities, with uh, a pattern of, uh, of uh, uh, social and cultural life, uh, and you find that somehow they manage to coexist. Uh, they, they either tolerate each other, or perhaps even better, they, they respect each other, they accommodate each other. But that's one kind of, you know, uh, pluralism, a way, a response to cope with the plurality that exists. There's another kind of pluralism where, you know, there are groups, but they are not very well bounded. There are people who are identify themselves uh, in terms of their groups, but the identities are not very categorical. Uh, there is no, you know, it's, you don't really have to choose uh, between one or the other, you can have multiple attachments, multiple allegiances, uh, and you do have intellectual differences, but those intellectual differences uh, are never seen as existential threats, so that, uh, you know, it's either you or me, uh, uh, and you must be exterminated, uh, you must be uh, expelled, and so on. You, you know, these, these differences are very sharp, They're, that they're, they're, they're fierce in some ways, but you know, it doesn't turn into a, a, a major uh, religious war or some kind of a genocide. Or, now, there is in India, I, can, I don't know about China, but in India, uh, I know from my friends, historian friends, that uh, there have been you know, radical differences, there have been skirmishes, but there is no real evidence of major religious persecutions or major religious wars. There have been other kinds of wars, I mean, political wars, and there have been other kinds of violence, but this has not been there. And I think it's not been there because of this fluidity, this hybridity, uh, this compositeness, when people can be both Hindu and Muslim, or half Hindu and Muslim, or sometimes Hindu, sometimes Muslim, <laughs> but, and, and you know this kind of dynam, dynam, dynamism, uh, which was and flexibility and fluidity, which characterized uh, people's uh, relations. Perhaps it was possible only because there was some other stable anchor, say the caste. Uh, that may be so, and that has to be you know properly uh, examined. But nonetheless, at this level of, you know, what we now what we call religion. Uh, uh, in, as, as belief and as, as ritual and rites, as forms of worship, and as a philosophical uh, perspective on, on the ultimate ends of, of the world and what is it that's going to save me 
given my finitude, all these issues, there was much greater movement and flexibility. But it begins to, you know, that no, it doesn't come to an end, but it has a major sort of uh, break put on it in the, in the late 19th century. I mean, there's, there are wonderful stories about imperial gazetteers uh, in going and visiting uh, various villages in the late 19th century and finding all the things that I mentioned, you know, these hybrid, dynamic, flexible, and you, by the time you come to the 20th, you know, 30 years later, the census is uh, uh, there and all kinds of governmentality to use, <laughs> and suddenly things begin to change. People are saying, you know, quite clearly that they belong to this religion or that religion and so on. So things change, but very recently. Uh, and so we have to now contend with a different kind of religious pluralism, the kind of religious pluralism uh, that, uh, that is, you know, that has different, very clearly defined groups coming together, whereas the earlier pluralism was much more amorphous and much more diffuse. And uh, so, yeah, we are talking about two different... If, you know, if, yeah. if I may add, um, I mean, as you know, the, there was not one gospel. There are four canonical gospels. And of course, there are many other non-canonical Gospels. And as you pointed out, Christianity was very pluralistic at the beginning. It was Constantine, the emperor, that brought the Christian bishops together in the First Ecumenical Council, forcing them, give me one credo, give me one for the whole empire. So the establishment begins as a political act of an emperor imposing one single form of Christianity upon the entire empire. So this is the emergence of Christendom. And this is the model then that develops as there can be only one religion in one political system. The religious wars were almost inevitable, not because people hated each other and religious were so fanatic, but because nobody, even those who really fought hard for Christian concordance, could accept the possibility of multiple churches living together side by side. There could be not multiple churches. There could only be one church and then the Cathars, heretics or but they, the heretics thought that they were the true and the others were the heretics. So the very notion of multiple forms of being Christian was simply not thinkable historically in the condition of Western developments. And so what, it's a combination of, on the one hand, multiplication of forms of Christianity through the Protestant Reformation and then all these sects going to America and creating a new system. And the new system is what we call the secular system is based on three principles. First, religion is a fundamental right, individual right. But the freedom of conscience, freedom of religion is an individual right. Not truths have rights, and this right, errors have no rights, but persons have rights. And this is the fundamental difference. If individuals have rights, then obviously it's not the truths that can be objectively, but individuals have the right to find their own truth. Second, a recognition, if you wish, a secular state that doesn't impose anymore one religion upon, upon its realm, but it accepts the religious pluralism within its realm, religious and secular pluralism. And the third, the acceptance of religious pluralism as an inevitable fact. P plurality becomes not a problem to be superseded, but simply the norm and something enriching. Yeah. So this is the difference between modern pluralism, that plurality is not a problem that has to be eliminated and has to be somehow superseded by unification, but acceptance. And I guess the transformation of the Catholic Church here is crucial. I mean, it was the Catholic Church that was the model of the one true church. But look what happened in Vatican II. Dignitatis humana, the recognition of the religious freedom and the base of the individual right, the sacred dignity of the human person. And second, nostra etate, our age. Our age is characterized by religious pluralism. It's a fundamental new sign. It's a new sign. Uh, 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 of the times. So the acceptance that this form of religious pluralism is a sign of the times is a fundamental recognition by the Global Council, the first council of global fathers from all over the globe that were living along with many other religions, not only in the context of European homogeneity and recognizing that this is going to be uh, the norm for global humanity, having to learn with, to live with religious pluralism. So this is, I think, what is new in our global context. But, uh, Charles, do you want to come in? Because I want to ask a couple of things. No, go ahead. I mean, yeah. 
No, I, I just want to say that, uh, again, okay. there, there, uh, a, a very old tradition has been disrupted in India, again, in the last 100 years or so. And that tradition was that uh, the, the political power, the king or, you know, what you might call old forms of state, they always patronized all religions. There is not a single instance in the past of, you know, what we began to term as an establishment of a particular religion. All religions were being uh, uh, patronized by the, by the king. And again, that has to do with the kind of plurality that I was talking about. Also, a person who declared that he was a follower of Buddha when, as a, a person meaning a, a, the political ruler who declared himself to be a follower of Buddha, he, the, 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 the consecration rituals and every other ritual was performed by the Brahmin as if the guy was a Hindu. So, so, and this is, also some, this is also a pattern that you see all through Indian history, right? I mean, in the first six, seven centuries, a number of kings were, were Buddhists, but they were always at the, uh, you know, they, there was always these Brahmins who were conducting all the rituals for, for them. So they, 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 no one actually saw that there was such a deep incompatibility or contradiction uh, between, uh, and that's between, between doing this. And that has to do with uh, things not being, you know, as it were, over-intellectualized into doctrines and practices not being turned into uh, rigid, uh, as if they have to be governed by rigid rules and where mutual exclusion, you know, uh, or uh, uh, you know, the idea that you have to either do this or that was not a very dominant thing. And, and uh, some of these old practices and ways of being have to be revived, in, you know, not revived, but reimagined uh, in contemporary life. And I think this is certainly what is happening in many parts of the United States and Canada and other places. Uh, unfortunately, we are regressing. <laughs> that's, that's the sad part. Um, we have more questions, so I'm going to start here. Um, thank you, old gentleman. Um, Mr. Taylor, you're not the only one over here. Um, yeah. Over here. Oh, there. Um, yeah, you're not the only one who has trouble understanding what postmodernism means. Uh, that's probably because postmodernism can mean anything you want it to mean, which is why it's such a convenient concept for uh, academics. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, well, the gentleman, about the uh, development of contradictory. Um, uh, movements uh, in terms of the tensions between secularity and religiosity over the generations. Obviously, as religions developed, as been alluded to, they tended to often work hand in glove with uh, the political authority of a, a king or a, some kind of elite. Um, obviously, in India, there was a caste system which was very strictly enforced, had very strict ideas of cross-contamination, literally, you know, uh, if uh, Brahman touched an untouchable, they were contaminated uh, and uh, forever. Um, and obviously, uh, in terms of the Inquisition, obviously there was uh, uh, enforced belonging to a, a doctrine as well, so there's compulsion in various ways. But we've seen in recent uh, eras, obviously, that lessening of compulsion. We've seen a reaction at times with Islamic fundamentalism, as we see, trying to impose coercion again. Um, and we've seen uh, uh, political influence uh, attempted to be uh, um, uh, indoctrinated by uh, Christian fundamentalist groups through uh, more secular political means in various ways. So my basic question is, is there, uh, are these basically um, reactionary movements or are they in a strange way evolutionary movements we have to work through in the sense that these reactions are, are almost like a pendulum swinging back, but eventually we will end up with a, a tolerant semi-secularity which will accommodate uh, an enlightened form of all these religions and that we'll all end up with what 
Francis Fukuyama, Fukuyama called the end of history an equivalent in terms of end of religiosity in that fundamentalist sense. We're, we're supposed to predict uh, whether this, I mean, I can make some guesses, that's all I can do, right? But it seems to me that the record up to now, it's neither we're moving towards some wonderful omega point, I don't know, poor tail to shop that, I don't mean to, but, and uh, we're inevitably going to get there, that doesn't seem to me to be very likely. Pendulum sounds as though we're going back always to the same thing again. And what you very often see is new forms of intolerance and, and uh, various kinds of religious persecution and so on, not exactly like the previous ones, but if, if they, they burst out from time to time. I think it's very, very, you'd be very brave if you, anybody made a, a sure prediction about how this is all going in this direction. Poor Francis Fukuyama, I know he's, he must be regretting his, <laughs> his too over hasty yeah, judgment 20 years ago. I mean, when I mentioned the three principles of individual religious freedom, secular state, neutral towards religions, and acceptance of religious pluralism, does not mean that this is accepted everywhere? Yeah. The world of Islam still works within the model of true and false religion. There are the true religion, the others are heretics, for the Sunni, the Shias are heretic. For the Shia, the Sunnis are heretics, and vice versa. And then the others are infidels, and the others are pagans. So they, they still maintain this model. Uh, uh, and so there is fundamental still transformation going on within the world of Islam to accept those principles. And there is a resurgence of fundamentalism precisely when they see that those principles are being somehow questioned and they are reasserted. But you also have a lot of states that do not accept the notion of being simply neutral states uh, protecting their, relig their religious freedom, plural freedoms of their citizens. I mean, the Chinese state is a, a state that for 2,000 years has basically determined what is the true and false orthodoxy and heterodoxy, not religion, true and false, but orthodoxy, heterodoxy, and still maintains this principle today and, and is not ready to abandon uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, monopoly of determining orthodoxy within the realm. And I can ask, I, I, one can say that uh, the Russian state the imperial, still maintains the notion of one fusion of church and state. So again, there are still uh, uh, a lot of uh, resistance to this, what I consider to be a modern development, certainly with the, since the declaration of the universal human rights in the United Nations, I think that the model of individual religious freedom is a new principle that has been globalized, but uh, with a lot of resistance. So. I have more questions uh, lined up, and there is time for them uh, to be asked, but I'll try and get in as many as we can. Uh, Kira. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to hear the three of you speaking on a panel together. Um, and I was just wondering if I could ask the three of you to comment on a little bit more on the relationship between modernity and secularism. So starting with the, so I mean, um, Jose, I really liked the point that you made about how, you know, we can look at the, the relationship not just as modernity being a diminishment of religious belonging or religion, but also being about pluralization of religious belonging and also a recognition and acceptance of that plural. Pluralization. Um, but I so, so those two models, but I'm also wondering, um, and this sort of relates to some of the things that you were saying, Raji, about whether there's also a third way in which we think about this relationship between modernity and religion, um, and that is about the kind of re-establishment of religion's important centrality um, and belonging, religious belonging as as actually something that is really crucial to that particular type of modernity. And I was thinking, Rajiv, when you said about the kind of communal violence that you see in, in South Asia, that I'm, I'm wondering if it's appropriate to think of that as just reproducing something that was happening in Europe in the 15th, 16th century, and whether it's actually not more appropriate to think of it as something that's inherently a product of a particular version of modernity. So, I mean, I'm thinking in, in, for example, the Sri Lankan state, the emergence of this kind of Buddhist nationalism is actually very much related to a modern logics of the nation state and also the, the sort of legacies of colonial 
ideas about religion and what religion and religious identity and belonging meant. Um, and so whether we need to factor in this other type of relationship between religion and modernity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think very much so. I mean, that's what I was trying to say at the end of my remark, that, that this is something new when religion becomes the marker of societies who are mobilizing around an identity, something that didn't exist you know, from most of human history. And that's the very worrying thing when you see Sri Lanka, but Burma as well, um, <clears throat> and many other countries, where now religion is being used in a new way, but reproducing certain forms of violence or repression and so on. That's the example of why we don't think of it, I don't think of it as a pendulum, the new forms of <laughs> the bad mode of coexistence can be in endlessly invented, and then we have to work against them as much as we can. Of course, the, the comparison between the 16th and 20th century is problematic, but there is something, something to it. I mean, I actually like to see or put as the, as the key date, 1492, not 1500. Mm -hmm. 1492, the first ma homogeneous confessional state, the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain to create a Catholic state through mobilization. So the notion of a confessional unified Catholic state, and of course, 1492 being also the, the year of the beginning of colonial, the European colonial expansion. So the two go together. So the Westphalian system is actually a homogenization through, through Europe of the principle of homogeneous confessional religion, one single one, and therefore ethno-religious cleansing is at the beginning of the formation of every early modern nation state in Europe. I mean, Northern Europe could not become homogeneous Protestant without getting rid of Catholics, and Southern Europe could not become homogeneous Catholic without getting rid of Protestants, and so on. There was a lot of ethno-religious cleansing in addition to the religious wars. So, to a certain extent, the globalization of the Westphalian system through post-colonial nation states has reproduced this model. And one of the paradoxes, especially in the Middle East, is that the very minorities, Jews and Muslims, that were expelled, uh, you have the traditional Ottoman Empire is able to, uh, ha again, have the, the living together of Christian Muslims and Jews. But once you have the modern Turkish state, this is not possible anymore. You have the reproduction of the ethno-religious cleansing throughout the Ottoman Empire. Then you have the same model in Israel. So you have, basically, this process of reconstruction of a process that started I would argue, in 16th century formation of homogeneous confessional nation states. Of course, they are different states. The 20th century modern nationalism is very different from the 16th century. So the, the, the parallels are, there are analogies and, and they are problematic, but there is something to it of the globalization of the Westphalian model through post-colonial national states. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't say that the, a simple reproduction, I said, Sadly, we are in many Asian countries, we are beginning to resemble you know, what happened, which is very different from saying that those things have been reproduced. I did say uh, that nationalism actually provides the fuel to all this, which is a certain kind of you know, modern, modernity. Uh, uh, so, 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 I mean, I entirely agree with, uh, with what Jose said. I mean, I also believe 1492 was a very crucial uh, uh, year uh, uh, in, in, in for, for uh, modern state formations uh, of a certain homogenous kind. I mean, I don't see wars, so-called wars of religion, only as wars of religion. There were wars also state uh, state formations. Yeah, there were also incipient, incipient, very incipient kind of, very different kind of, you know, name, nap kind of, you know, this uh, uh, the, the coincidence between religion and state is, it, it has some features of, of incipient nationalism there, that's all yeah, there. And so, so we have a very, uh, something, early modern period is, is a very interesting period uh, in understanding many of the things, many of the trends that take place later. I also I want to add one more thing, this, because Jose mentioned this true and false, uh, this model is very, is still sort of followed in Islam. I think this model has actually been Secularized. You find this model in a lot of places. It's not just restricted to Islam or to certain sections of Christianity. It's there in, in it was there in Stalinism. 
uh, it was there in uh, in uh, uh, scientism. It was there in scientism, uh, and and you know, so, so the atheists and the, and the people with scientific temper have all kinds of very exclusionary attitude towards it. people with religion. That's false consciousness, and this is true. And then there is, of course, nationalism. It doesn't quite appear in the same form, but it's in the chosen people, the best people, the greatest people, the greatest nation on earth. I mean, we have in some form a very similar kind of thing being reproduced in nationalism, where something is supposed to be the greatest and the others are in some ways, you know, not quite there. Uh, or or far uh, far away from this. so i think this distinction which people like jean asman have called the mosaic distinction i mean that's it's not just restricted to uh, as a conceptual resource in the abrahamic traditions uh, or now in islam but it's widely secularized and it plays havoc in everywhere and very anti pluralist Thank you. It's a terrific panel. My question is for Professor Taylor um, about the concept of the seekers who followed an ethics of authenticity. Um, so, in a secular age, we're presented with new and dynamic options for finding a deeper sense of meaning, and it's very close to the concept of self-creation. I was wondering if you could talk about the limiting or negative ramifications. Or consequences of a self-seeking ethic, where existential meaning seems to be based on choice, and it's a very anthropocentric view. I wonder if there's something wrong or missing or at stake when you're able to say, "I can choose what kind of Catholic I want to be," or when you say, "I can choose what kind of atheist I am." I think that there's a big confusion around the concept of choice here because it's. Choice is always used in a context, right? So when we say it's your choice, what do we mean? Well, we might mean, politically speaking, or legally speaking, or in terms of the law, you can choose. But when that doesn't mean that you can use that concept in another sense. That I am choosing what's really important. I mean, what do you mean choosing what's really important? You're seeking what's really important. You're trying to <clears throat> move towards it. You're following your hunches, but you're not, in that sense, choosing. So the reason why we speak of choice here is that we're speaking of it in that other context. Right? We are very often moved from regimes in which it is not your political choice, or regimes in which some authority is imposing on you. And then we want to, in relation to that, talk about it being something chosen, and it's being right that it's something chosen. But when you think of what it is to search for the deepest meaning in life, you're not. I'm not saying, well, well, I like to have a religious meaning, or well, I'm flip. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. And I think that we can easily confuse uh, these two levels, and we very often do. But we really. Understand the concept of choice always has a meaning within a certain context, right? That is, it, it, or it, it, in each particular context, it negates something else, right? Which is non-choice. But what is being negated may be simply imposition on me, not uh, <clears throat> not the fact that when I seek the meaning of my life, I feel drawn to something. I feel I'm pulled in this direction. Maybe we can collect questions. Uh, yeah, if, if everybody, uh, so, um, really short question. I, you're in a queue where you're about number 13. <laughs> I don't think I can ask of them to respond to 13 questions. So I think we'll do three or four now and see where we're at in a couple of minutes. Uh, after that, uh, Professor Taylor, um, Professor Casanova just made the point in his talk that um, uh, disenchantment, he just said, is not universal to an imminent frame. And he gave the example, I think, if I, if I was hearing him correctly, 
uh, the United States. You were saying this disenchantment wasn't there. And I simply just put, wanted to hear your response to that uh, particular claim from Professor Casanova. Oh, I think that that's what I was saying earlier about even Weber uh, uses this word in two senses. The one, the, the broader sense you use it in is just the opposite of, of, um, of belief, right? And in that sense, Jose's remark is entirely right. It does not mean that you, uh, it does not mean that you desert religion. But if you take it in the stricter sense, the sense in which it was originally introduced, which is talking about, uh, I mean, let me say something very, very complex because that's the best way of capturing it. The, the different practices that were targeted by uh, developing either originally Hebrew or Catholic or eventually Protestant religion as very bad practices later emerged as uh, magic, right? So, I mean, for the, for the Calvinist, even the mass is magic. Right? So, <clears throat> you might say, not that we have an antecedent criterion for magic, but that we've developed in Western Christianity a kind of post hoc notion of what magic is. That means the forms that we find idolatrous or that we can't square with our faith. And it's a lot of these, these practices are ones that, as it were, make sense within a world in which we find ourselves surrounded by spirits and forces and so on. The narrow sense of disenchantment is where that disappears from our experience. And that's quite different from the broader notion of disenchantment where we desert uh, religion altogether. On the contrary, very often the, the engine of disenchantment in the narrow sense has been very strong religious belief in that other sense. I rarely have a, a discussion with Charles, and this, but here I think there is something, the notion that uh, this disenchantment, that the spirits disappear everywhere is simply not true. Mm -hmm. You have the emergence, I mean, Pentecostal Christianity yeah. is the most uh, uh, vital form of Christianity throughout the world and is linked to the belief in the spirits. It is because you believe in the spirits, all kinds of spirits, ancestors, cults, that you have the power of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual warfare. And, and uh, shamanism doesn't disappear from Korean culture. Uh, folk religion, all kinds of belief in spirits, no. doesn't disappear in Chinese culture with modernization. So there is a sense, and actually there is a way in which we understand the need to re-spiritualize nature. Nature that was the one that we had to get rid of spirits is, is purely a, a dead. We realize that it's not. It's living nature, it's part of our environment, and we need to learn to resacralize nature, to have a different type of relationship uh, with a spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that we are, in a sense, uh, 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 I mean, the, the narrow form of disenchantment that the Enlightenment assumed, I think, is, uh, I think was necessary to establish the immanent frame, but the immanent frame itself uh, is globalized without necessarily mm -hmm. disenchanting traditional religions in other places. This will be the claim I make. Very much true of India as well. Yeah, in India, yeah. yeah. So, uh, thank you. This is a wonderful uh, conversation. I want to uh, be a little bit provocative here um, and make an argument for intolerance and encroachment. Um, and uh, it strikes me that you could make a strong argument that the uh, uh, Fund, most fundamentalist religion of our time is market fundamentalism, or at least it's a competitor in the mix of fundamentalisms. Um, and so uh, it, it also at the same time seems to me that, uh, say, indigenous cosmologies across the Andes and Point de Vere, um, the Pope's uh, Laudato Si, are, are um, uh, rising um, forms of intolerance of a certain kind of religious fundamentalism that we don't recognize as religious, we, but it's market fundamentalism. Um, and that, that it, encroachment is a, a, an important part of most religion that is meaningful. Um, and it has to, and that um, encroachment has to be obviously modulated by all the things you're talking about, but we have to think about the tension between legitimate forms of encroachment and tolerance and the ways in which those lines are always contested. One. I would just 
like to hear any of you reflect on that. Problematic. I I, I fully agree. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, certainly Pope Francis will fully agree with you in terms of the way he talks of the economy. And the same you could say about the way it was transferred to forms of science, scientist fundamentalism, accepting this the only form of knowledge, or political secularism, creating only one type of uh, space uh, and uh, eliminating other forms of space. So in this respect, yes, there are, uh, uh, it's not, religion has not the monopoly of intolerance. Uh, and, but there is something interesting about even uh, 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 tolerant societies that may be so tolerant that they cannot tolerate intolerance. And I mean, I always see Holland as one of very interesting case, where society that welcome the minorities, it welcomed the Sephardic Jews from Spain and Portugal, it welcomed the Puritans from England, it welcomed the Libertines from the, from the Enlightenment that were expelled and so on. Uh, today, but they were not forced to become Dutch. They could remain different, and this was the kind of tolerance of that society. But today, that society has become so tolerant, so liberal, that it cannot tolerate the masses because they are not themselves tolerant. So you have, you have again, you have here you have to be careful uh, in terms of the logics of tolerance and intolerance at which level we are talking. Yes. Um, I have a question here, and there are two in the back. I'd like the, all three to be asked, and for you to respond with as much time that is left. Okay. So, did, did you not? No, I'm sorry. Oh, it was you. Sorry. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Charles, does uh, secular and religious ways of belonging represent different sources of the self? I got it wrong. Well, my question concerns the fight for justice. Now, from one perspective, there's a terrorist. From another perspective, there's a freedom fighter. When, when groups have a sense of being oppressed, how do we discern whether the source of that oppression is religious identity, political deprivation, or economic deprivation? And I agree particularly with those that are the victims of, of, of a market where they have a sense of not belonging. How do we go about discerning the source of that conflict in order to resolve it? Mm -hmm. uh, the third person I saw here has left, and so I'm <laughs> just gonna leave the two questions that have been asked on the floor because I see the time is ticking. And I apologize to everyone who put the hand up. Um, there simply isn't enough time. This is a very stimulating conversation, but Point. Yeah, no, I don't think that they, we're talking about different forms of the self. I mean, we're, I think we're talking about different senses of the world, the bigger picture in which the self is situated. And certainly, it, the, the mode of self-identification, which, which arises from these different kinds of are very, very different. But it, but when we talk about a self, we talk about a being that is capable of determining its or responding to a relationship to something larger around it. Um, the, the last question, I think that's a very, very uh, interesting point because there are really two issues here. One is you know, what kind of oppression or, or not exists, which creates kind of discontent under which people can react in that way. But another uh, very important question is, I think, the one we really need to be clear about today when we're talking about existing terrorism like Islamic State, it's to what extent we can explain this terrorism in terms of the cause, and to what extent it has to do with certain kinds of breakdown, identity loss. Um, you know, if you look at the people that actually become terrorists, this point is made by 
a lot of people like Olivier Roy and uh, Georgier have made this point that you have people who have had very often terrible childhoods in which they have, um, haven't been able to form a stable, really stable identity. Many of them have already lived a life of crime before they flip over and become <clears throat> agents of, of Islamic State and so on. Uh, they resemble much more earlier phenomena in Europe, like the Red Army Fraction or the Brigati Rossi, and that's the only, that is, people who are really looking for this cause because they are in some ways resolving some deep uh, identity crisis. And so that's, uh, I think, we make a huge mistake uh, in a lot of European countries at the moment, in Canada as well, in taking at face value the idea that these people are responding out of <clears throat> Islamic conviction only. And that, mean, that misleads us very, very considerably into, into not seeing the, the actual sources that will, that will produce new recruits. I think it's, of course, very, very dangerous to say which type of violence are justified and therefore are good fighters, and which type of violence are illegitimate and therefore they are terrorists. Uh, but I think one of the most interesting developments of the 20th century has been the emergence of uh, movements of uh, nonviolent resistance, right? Beginning with Gandhi in India, those are not pacifist movements. Those are basically movements, struggles for justice, very, very active. You could say very aggressive, uh, very, very uh, determined, and yet trying to use nonviolent means. And then, of course, it was the civil rights movement in, in the United States. It was, it was South Africa, the Mandela. I mean, those are fundamental ways of uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 develop struggles for justice, and yet precisely having a particular relationship to the problem of violence to try to solve, which, of course, raises all kinds of issues about the old tradition of just war. Is there ever a just war? Justified. I think that we've moved, and certainly in the Catholic tradition, there is a passage almost from just war theory to peacemaking. It's not enough just simply. So uh, peacemaking at any, uh, not pacifism, but peacemaking that precisely requires to look for the conditions for real justice, long-lasting justice and peace. So uh, in this, I think that um, uh, I, I would be reluctant to uh, say these violent movements are good, these violent movements are bad, those are terrorists, the others are freedom fighters. I think that there is a problem with every form of violent movements to achieve any kind of justice. And I think that this is the one of the recognitions of these movements of the 20th century that is worth pursuing. I just like to say uh, one, one thing about uh, you know, sources of terrorism, uh, or rather sources of you know, the motivations of terrorists. And I think we need to make a distinction between two different kinds of people who get into this movement. Uh, the one that I want to talk briefly about are the are certain elites, people who are well-educated, people who are you know, thriving. I'm, I'm talking about people from Saudi Arabia, you know, a lot of people from Saudi Arabia, people like Osama bin Laden or you know, the, the high-tech guys who get into it. I think there is uh, an element of uh, some kind of, at that very elite level, some experience of humiliation. Uh, there is also a, 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 set, a, a certain kind of vanguardism that we have to, you know, lead the people uh, by doing these kind of exemplary acts. And uh, there is also, a, a, you know, these are people who have uh, not been properly uh, born in, I mean, uh, properly educated or, in, you know, initiated into their religions in their childhood. Uh, and, and so there is a born again element here. So, so among at least these people who have been spearheading some of the terrorist attacks, uh, these three, uh, humiliation, vanguardism, and born againism, all these also play a very important role. But that's not, it doesn't exhaust uh, uh, or the motivations of uh, or, or people who get into these movements, but, but I think some of that you can explain in these terms. Um, yeah, we have to end. It's been a fantastic conversation. It feels like we're just beginning to uh, 
go somewhere uh, and could go much further than we have. Um, but we can continue it outside. There's a reception there with some food and wine. But before we get to that, I want to thank Roji Bhargav, Jose Casanova, Charles Taylor for their wonderful contributions this evening. And I also especially want to thank Charles Taylor for a magical fortnight of conversation and companionship. And I hope he's back here again soon. Thank you.